Hi there, my name is Dr. Travis Holland and I'm a Senior Lecturer in Communication at Charles Sturt University, Australia. This podcast is an exploration into our digital society. It forms the lectures for my class, envisioning the digital society, but also aims to engage you, the listener out there beyond my classroom. If you like what you hear, please send a voice comment through Anchor or Spotify or get in contact via the details in the show notes. In this episode, I'm looking at whether the internet can be regulated. We'll consider three major case studies of internet regulation from around the world, and I'll engage with the notion of cyber libertarianism. As part of that engagement, I'll play parts of J.P. Barlow's nearly 30-year-old Declaration of the Independence of Cyberspace. Dr. Tracy Edmondson drops in with her look at the Australian government's anti-trolling legislation and its impact on a sports broadcaster. And just a warning, this episode does contain references to some disturbing events. Welcome to Digital Society. Technology has often been a high-profile target of regulation and attempted regulation by civil authorities around the world. And the internet is no exception. From moral panics over specific types of content considered dangerous or immoral, to nation-states cutting off the internet to prevent or reduce protests, internet regulation runs the gamut. In this episode, I will introduce three case studies drawn from different types of regulation around the world. The case studies are the Great Firewall of China, the Christchurch Call, and Australian Mandatory Data Retention Regulations. Each of these has been enacted for different purposes. You may agree or not agree with those purposes. That's not the point. The point of the exploration is to use these three cases to help think through how and why the internet might be regulated and what forms that regulation might take. Before I get to those, I want to take a look at the notion of cyber libertarianism and as an entry point into that field, particularly John Perry Barlow's Declaration of the Independence of Cyberspace. Cyber libertarianism is the notion that the internet can and should be free of control by both government and non-government entities, that it is a democratic space in which individual liberty is paramount. The philosophy extends to the idea that we should be free to choose how we present ourselves online as well as elsewhere in life. And this notion has recently been under challenge by anti-queer rhetoric and legislation in the US and elsewhere. The idea that people should be free to adapt any identity they wish online is under threat as anonymity, anonymity itself can be seen as a challenge to hegemonic power. And to be clear, these aren't just rhetorical strategies. They have very real, dangerous consequences for the people targeted. And now we return to John Perry Barlow and a document he drafted in 1996, which, for good or ill, has become something of a lightning rod for both supporters and critics of cyber-libertarian thought. Barlow founded the Electronic Frontier Foundation and was a frontman for the rock band The Grateful Dead, In this document, he declares the independence of cyberspace in terms that very much draw on the United States Declaration of Independence, itself a revolutionary document. Barlow's fiery idealism was challenging to achieve in 1996, and I would suggest it remains out of grasp now. In an article from 2009, researcher Amy Morrison labelled it an impossible future, she says, quote, 10 years after its original publication, the de- Declaration is both widely reprinted and increasingly mocked. Its language has become commonplace and its idealism has come to seem absurd. I'll link to Morrison's article in the show notes. I'll also link to a 20 year retrospective published in Wired magazine. Here are some excerpts from Barlow's Declaration in his own voice as recorded by Ideologue in a video available on the platform Vimeo. Governments of the industrial world, you weary giants of flesh and steel, I come from cyberspace, the new home of mind. On behalf of the future, I ask you of the past 
to leave us alone. You are not welcome among us. You have no sovereignty where we gather. You have no moral right to rule us, nor do you possess any methods of enforcement we have true reason to fear. Governments derive their just powers from the consent of the governed. You have neither solicited nor received ours. We did not invite you. You do not know us, nor do you know our world. Cyberspace does not lie within your borders. Do not think that you can build it as though it were a public works project. You cannot. It is an act of nature, and it grows itself through our collective actions. I'll drop more excerpts from the Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace throughout the remainder of the episode. Now, I want to introduce the first case study, which is the Great Firewall of China. Just as cyber libertarianism adopts language that recalls US nationalism, the Great Firewall of China is a somewhat derogatory term coined by Western critics that refers to a collection of regulations and technologies meant to control the infiltration of foreign information into China. It is named, of course, after China's actual Great Wall, one of the wonders of the ancient world. The firewall operates by scanning incoming TCP packets for particular keywords and preventing those which are found to contain offending information. The effect is that many of the West's most popular websites are banned or limited in China, including Facebook, Google and Wikipedia. The flip side of these policies is that China's domestic internet companies have been able to develop without significant competition from the Western giants. These include microblogging and social media site Baidu, the gaming and social media giant Tencent, which owns WeChat, and ByteDance, the owner of TikTok. And as these companies continue to grow, their influence beyond China grows with them. To such a point that they, in fact, are now challenging to be named some of the world's biggest companies. You claim... There are problems among us that you need to solve. You use this claim as an excuse to invade our precincts. Many of these problems don't exist. Where there are real conflicts, where there are wrongs, we will identify them and address them by our means. The second case study is the Christchurch Call. A horrific terrorist attack in 2019 in Aitoria, New Zealand, was live-streamed across social platforms by the terrorist and rapidly, rapidly distributed across other media. The distribution of the footage energised critics to call for regulation of such material by social media companies amidst fears that live-streaming and social technologies create a sense of action or heroism among would-be attackers and the distribution of the footage itself is also traumatising for viewers, communities and those targeted. New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern and French President Emmanuel Macron convened a summit of governments and corporations to address the matter. This resulted in the release of an agreement formerly known as the Christchurch Call to Eliminate Terrorist and Violent Extremist Content Online. Here's Ardern speaking before the summit. We were left reeling after the 15th of March terrorist attack. We are not the first country to experience an attack like that, but what happened in Christchurch was unique in one particular way. This was a terrorist act that was designed to go viral. The terrorist, he live streamed his attack and the video in the aftermath was altered multiple times in order to enable it to get around automatic takedown. On Facebook alone, it was shared over 1.5 million times. New Zealanders and those abroad witnessed that video, not because they were necessarily seeking it out, but because the proliferation of it was so extreme. We're left, therefore, 
with, I think, a sense of responsibility, a duty of care to try and, yes, prevent terrorist attacks like this ever happening on our soil again, but to also try and prevent that sharing of terrorist content, of extreme violent content online. The Christchurch call includes commitments from governments, online platforms and collaborative actions. These include enforcing and developing applicable laws, encouraging media ethics, community standards in terms of service which prohibit extremist content and moderation resources for this content. It's a notable form of regulation because rather than just responding with laws passed by parliaments, the Christchurch call is actually more of a collaborative approach which partners with the platforms. In China, Germany, France, Russia, Singapore, Italy, and the United States, you are trying to ward off the virus of liberty by erecting guard posts at the frontiers of cyberspace. These may keep out the contagion for a small time, but they will not work in a world that will soon be blanketed with bit-bearing media. Finally, I want to take a look at Australian mandatory data retention legislation. After a long and contentious debate, in 2015, the then Australian Coalition Government, with the support of the opposition Labor Party, passed mandatory data retention legislation. This legislation requires internet service providers to retain information about who holds accounts, what IP addresses are assigned to particular devices, what addresses are visited by those IPs, who sends emails to whom, and who makes phone calls to whom for a period of two years. The information can be sought from the service providers by a very wide range of agencies, essentially anyone with law enforcement powers. But this isn't limited to your standard law enforcement agencies. Journalists are excluded from the legislation, or rather, they require additional warrants to obtain information. But journalists is narrowly defined, and it means only a person who is working in a professional capacity as a journalist. The legislation and similar mandatory data retention legislation has been widely criticised by organisations such as the Electronic Frontiers Foundation, who I've mentioned earlier in the episode, you will, you will have noticed. They said, Government-mandated data retention impacts millions of ordinary users, compromising online anonymity that is crucial for whistleblowers, investigators, journalists and those engaging in political speech. National data retention laws are invasive, costly and damage the right to privacy and free expression. I'll put a link to the article where that quote comes from as well. You'll note, of course, that in highlighting this regulation um, and mandatory data retention in general, I'm pointing out or contrasting it with the notions of anonymity uh, and identity talked about by Barlow. I'm now for Tracy Edmondson's look at Australian anti-trolling legislation. The regulation um, of internet in Australia is an important role in the federal government's commitment to keeping everyday Australians safe from online harms. This was one that um, it was prompted by another case um, in the High Court um, handed down the year before, um, which actually... um, Basically, it, it, it showed that anybody who had a social media page may be exposed to defamation liability for defamatory posts that others make on their page, even if they're not aware of the, the post. So what, what this means, and essentially for even the organisation I work in, community sports, anyone really, any business that owns, if you have a Facebook page and people comment, if they make defamatory comments, if you don't remove those comments, 
um, that you can be um, sued, you can be um, for defamation. Um, so it, it's a really in, in, interesting um, finding and or handing down that came came from the High Court, and it prompted um, the Australian government to have a look at ways to help um, keep everyday Australians safe from online harms and issues associated with these defamatory posts on social media. They can obviously be spread virally across the, the platform, which much of the content being um, unfiltered. Um, it, it's a really, because a lot of them are anonymous, it's very difficult for people to um, pursue defamation proceedings, um, especially for everyday Australians. Um, you know, one of the cases that I quoted in there was, um, you know, like a high profile celebrity, Erin Molan, who talked about, um, you know, what she had to go through to um, launch defamation proceedings when she was um, accused of being racist. And, you know, she said that um, it's an experience you wouldn't wish on your worst enemy. Um, it's obviously also very expensive. And so a lot of people probably wouldn't even wouldn't even bother. Um, so the Australian government's um, social media bill was designed to to help um, people who wish to um, you know pursue these defamation um, issues. Um, they had a they ran a consultation um, process on it, and then finally the the bill was introduced into Parliament um, early last year. Um, the idea from the government was that it would empower Australians to, um, you know, unmask these originators of uh, anonymous defamatory posts made in social media. But um, the people like Erin Molan and others um, believe it's, um, you know, whilst it goes some way to helping, that, that it's, it is actually going to be quite difficult for everyday Australians to take up because of the cost and effort involved. Since the first episode of this podcast, I've promised the inclusion of some student voices. First out of the gate is Yasmin, who sent in this voice message. Hi, my name is Yasmin. I'm in my second year of study at Charles Sturt University with Bachelor of Communications. I'm currently living in Canada for a year and travelling around while studying, so I'm still trying to get on top of that time zone difference. Um, I'm really looking forward to this unit and delving into digital literacy and our roles and influence in our ever-changing digital landscape, uh, not just as communication professionals, but as individuals and society as a whole. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Digital Society. Don't forget... I'd love to include your voice on an episode, so send a clip through Anchor or Spotify. I'm Travis Holland. Talk to you next time.